Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish up this week's theme of saxophone, but not jazz, with a group called The Family Crest. I learned about this group on a live stream quite some time ago with the song Beneath the Brine. I think it was an Audio Tree live uh, video and just a phenomenal song. They've been on my my listen list for quite some time. I've been meaning to get into them and I just haven't found the time yet. And this is actually from their 2022 album, The War Act 2. We're going to be checking out the song Hearts on Fire. So let's dive into this and see what they're bringing to the table today. Mm, starting off with the sax. Cast your heart to the floor, love. Feel the sting. Feel the weight of love. Yeah, great way to, to contrast the opening. The sparse arrangement here. Those beautiful swells. Really catchy chorus right here. What melody writing? Interesting. I really wish something uh, something else happened in that bridge. Okay. Yeah, very different vibe from Beneath the Brine, which is more uh, melancholic. 
It's heavier. This is uh, bright and bouncy. In fact, in fact, you know, this definitely has a lot of modern pop to it. I don't think I'd blame anybody for calling this a pop song or uh, maybe even pop rock in a sense. But honestly, what I get here is funk all over the place. The saxophone is funky. The bass line is funky. The push into the falsetto and really staying up there is so funky. <laughs> There's so much funk influence here. And it's kind of paired with some modern pop aesthetics. So is this funk pop? Should I add that to my list of fictional fizzy drinks, genty pop, <laughs> blackened pop, and now funky pop? Should I go into soda making instead of music? I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that funk is jazz. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the angle that this could be viewed from a strictly pop angle, but I don't know, every bit of it feels very jazzy to me. But I still want to dive into it because there's some cool things going on here that I really enjoyed. Uh, so first of all, the song starts off with the saxophone. We get a little taste of it, and then it dips out. Interesting decision. The saxophone pops up in both of the choruses, all three of the choruses, um, and the second verse. It kind of pops up with some uh, some ornamental ideas against the vocal melody, and that's it. It's sort of relegated just to the chorus. It's an interesting idea to tie an instrument that's so prominent in the mix. I mean, it's very much in the spotlight. I'd almost say that it's overpowering the vocals even at times in the chorus um, and only utilizing it for one section. It really gives the chorus of a defined vibe that none of the other sections have. In fact, I'd say even the all three of the sections have very distinct personalities to them, very distinct uh, characteristics, where the verse is rather muted and subdued, the chorus is large and funky, and our bridge is sort of pop rocky with like we've re we've removed everything down to just the rhythm section, which is a typical rock uh, composition, and went with the guitar solo. And we did it for such a short amount. I really wish something else had been done with that bridge, not replacing it entirely, just allowed it to evolve into something other than the 16 bar idea that was sort of brand new and then just abandon it as soon as we got it. And we'll get into that in a second. We're talking about the saxophone right here. Uh, but the saxophone does pull us out of the bridge. I feel, uh, man, it's in, uh, we'll get to the bridge. We'll get to, Brian, get off of that. <laughs> Stick to the saxophone. Um, so the saxophone does use a lot of these syncopated lines. Da 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 Right? It's very jazzy. There's a, a not, I don't think there's a swinginess to it, but because of the syncopation, it kind of leans into uh, the same kind of feel that swing does. That's, I mean, funk is just really good at that altogether, of not swinging their eighth notes, but syncopating them against downbeats so that they still have that same vibe, that same feeling. It's about uh, shifting weight, right? Um, and we get a lot of these little ideas, right, mixed with uh, longer held out notes like da 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 ba ba dum cha ba bui dum right we get those those nice punctuated lines at the end of the melodies where uh, we kind of hear these longer uh, sections that kind of showcase the timbre of the saxophone against these shorter staccato notes um, and it just gives this nice ebb and flow to the melody writing in the saxophone, but it's also just very typical funk saxophone. So while it is done very well, I don't want to like hold Family Crest as doing something unique with the saxophone, um, or at least not give the impression that I I would love to hold them up as doing something unique, right? I really enjoy the band, but uh, this just isn't it. It's, it's very typical funk writing for the saxophone, um, but I love it here. I really do. Uh, and this is, you know, pretty much what the saxophone does the entire song. It sits above the band and provides this funky syn syncopation uh, mixed with the longer notes to give it this ebb and flow, right? Um, 
But what's interesting, I think, is that, you know, I mentioned the bass is funky, right? And the drums are a bit funky, too. We get that uh, that nice open hi-hat into the closed hi-hat. Every beat, it changes. So you get that and you get that with the bass and the snare hits accenting the beats in the rhythmic pattern that they are giving it that funkiness. And the whole thing is just like very upbeat about the way that it's all crafted. So we got like this funky upbeatness there. We got the syncopation in the bass. We got the syncopation in the, in the uh, saxophone. All this like funky rhythmic ideas and sonic ideas, right? I mean, the bass and the guitar is our rhythm section. It's minus a piano, but it's the rhythm section for a jazz uh, group. Um, and then we have our saxophone lead on top of it. Like this is a very, very stripped down jazz section, but it's a, it's a pretty typical jazz composition here. And then we have these very wide synths providing these orchestral stingers and these long uh, uh, crescendo hits, right? It'd be like, blah, blah, really like fading into these notes, right? Um, starting smaller, bringing the volume up. We call those crescendos. Um, here's the thing though. Strings don't typically get used in jazz. In fact, it's such a, a strange thing for me to hear that. I'm not saying it never happens, right? We can definitely have violins or cellos. Uh, upright basses are kind of close. They kind of have a similar thing to the cello going on. Different instruments um, all together, but, um, you know, kind of in the same area. So it's not like, it's not like this stuff never appears in jazz. It's just a bit on the fringe we don't typically especially string sections here i hear multiple violins maybe even a cello in there and possibly a viola as well it's a, a pretty wide string section providing the chordal stuff on the periphery of our of our sound sphere it's not centered at all it's a very wide sound um and i think there was even one part where we had a, a string run where it's like da -da 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 da 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 like we had this nice like rising idea out of the strings that brought us into the chorus or something like that. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, like these are not typical for jazz. Musically, we can kind of hear some of this stuff, but sonically, these timbres are just not here. And when we mix the melodic ideas with the timbre itself, I hear classical. And because of that, my brain had a real tough time. Like, eventually I got into it. It works somehow. Uh, it's not one of those things where, like, you know, I'd have to listen to it a few times, and it's an acquired taste, and, you know, I just didn't quite get it this time. No, it was like, it just clicked. It took me a, a verse, right? But after the first verse where it was kind of bonkers, and the second verse comes in, I'm like, yeah, it works. But I don't know why it works, because my brain really clashes hard on this. All right, we have super funky ideas everywhere. We have some poppy funk vocals on top of that. And then a classical string section. Why does it work? Why does it work? I don't know. But so we have some classical ideas. We have some funky ideas and we have some pop ideas. And that's this whole song to me is it's, is it's funky classical pop kind of idea. And the classical is like primarily a sonic thing, right? There's no classical composition that I'd say is really in here. The the string run kind of, like I said, you can hear that in jazz too. Uh, you know, the fade in notes, not so popular in jazz, especially not funk, which is more of energetic and about punctuated ideas. But still, it's, you know, we, we, it's I've heard it a couple times in some jazz tunes. Uh, it's just really the sonic quality. What instrument is bringing these ideas to the table? Um, and, you know, where else do I hear these ideas? And, uh, yeah, it's just kind of like this oddball left field decision. That just really works, though, right? I think the song comes together in a great... And I think that's because the, the middle point is pop. It's not a funk song. Not by any stretch. I would not go out and call this a jazz song. I would not say that, you know, in 50 years, this is going to be the, one of the next jazz standards. Um, 
and it has this classical element, but it's not really a classical song. I think it's because pop kind of sits in the middle and pulls both of them together. Uh, but I don't know if anybody else heard that either. Like, maybe some people are just like, yeah, everything works together fine. Nothing's odd here. And I'm just like, what's going on? <laughs> um, one thing that I came in expecting because of Beneath the Brine was uh, multi-layered melodic and harmonic composition. Didn't quite get a lot of that. To me, it felt like a lot of the elements were working together. Uh, I know, well, I don't know what instruments are being played here. I don't know what the band is like. From what I understand, Beneath the Brine is a couple of albums back. Um, and from pictures that I've seen of the group uh, while looking them up to see, you know, what albums I should add to my list and list and stuff, it looks like the group has been shrinking or at least the musicians, the number of musicians that were in that audio tree live video are not the same number as musicians that I see now. So, I mean, they could have just had um, some live performers as well. I don't, I don't know the thing, but uh, you know, when I watched the Audio Tree live video, they had a trombonist, they had a flutist, uh, they had a couple vocalists. Well, they had a couple of people who did vocals. Everybody did double things. Uh, you know, they had their guitarist, their drummer. Um, they had a cellist, I think. Maybe a violinist, too. Uh, there was just there was at least seven people in this little room. Um, and it was just gorgeous because all of these they they had uh you know multiple moving parts at one time really great ideas for a counterpoint they had these lovely melodies and here everything feels like it's just doing the same thing this is a lot more poppy whereas beneath the brine is more indie folk kind of realm and for better or worse i you know the song is catchy right it is something that you just kind of jam along with and i enjoyed it for that for sure but I also feel like the composition took, I don't want to say took a hit. The composition is simpler, for better or worse. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Um, and I, I just came in, I think, with the wrong expectations, the wrong mindset to fully enjoy this because I'm comparing it to something else I've heard of them, which is not a fair way to listen to anything. Um, I think most music, if not all music, should be compared to itself in a vacuum, at least primarily. I don't think there's anything wrong in comparing music to other things, and that's how we kind of, uh, you know, learn about music as a whole. What does this song do? What does that song do? What's the similarities? What's the differences? That's the whole idea behind genres, which allow us to communicate about music easier, gives us shorthand for it. But I don't think that's the best way to go into listening to music for a first time is immediately comparing it to stuff because nothing's going to live up to something else. All art is different. So, but yeah, so a lot of the ideas sit here are similar. We have many ideas, especially when we get to the chorus, that are either providing a chordal floor or mimicking a similar melody that the vocals are doing. Uh, and so we have what sounds to be maybe six or seven instruments here that all just kind of fall into three categories, rhythmic, chordal, or melodic. Um, we do have a little bit of counterpoint in the saxophone that goes above this track, and sometimes it's really good, and other times it kind of lines up with what the vocals are doing, and I love the sort of playfulness with it, where they kind of divert, and then they come back together, and they, they divert a little bit. Um, but honestly, I, I, like I mentioned, I don't know if it's the production on this or what, but the saxophone overpowers the vocals. Um, it may be just be because the vocals go into a falsetto, and I feel like there's less power behind it, especially compared to what feels more comfortable chest voice in the vo in the verse. Um, but it goes into the, the head voice, the falsetto, and it gets a little less power behind it, um, which I think fits well with like that falsetto funky style of singing. But it just gets so overpowered by this full-bodied saxophone that it almost ends up, at least in my mind, in more of a textual idea sort of like black metal where the vocal or post metal where the vocals get pushed into the mix to be an additional texture to the song and that's kind of what it felt like to me which is just 
really weird because it doesn't feel like that's what the song wants, but that's what the that's what the engineer made it do. If that makes sense, the composition tells me something than the engineering does. Uh, and so I was just kind of a little confused there, but I really enjoy the chorus too. It works. I don't know if it's the best it can be, but it's really well done. I was dancing half the time. So, I mean, is it a failure? Obviously not. Was it done wrong, though? I don't know. It's a pop song that's infectious. It's a pop song that gets people moving. I mean, that sounds like a win to me. But is it a 9 when it could have been a 9.5? Maybe. There's something about the saxophone that just doesn't fit right for me all of the time. And again, I don't know if it's a sax. It could be completely production-wise. I don't know. Um, I do love the vocals, though. I just want to point that out real quick. Uh, this vocalist it just has a gorgeous voice. Fell in love with it on Beneath the Brine. No different here. Absolute powerhouse. Uh, especially just the raw range of it all. But I did say I was going to bring up the bridge later, and I, I, I need to bring this up. I have no idea what's going on with this bridge. The guitar has barely been present at all. Like I just mentioned, a lot of the stuff just kind of blends together in the chorus. The verse, I think we pare it down, right? And I love the contrast, right? Big moments versus small moments. That's the whole idea behind the composition of this track. The guitar is just always overpowered if it's even there. I honestly couldn't tell you if the guitar is there. I kind of hear a picking sound, the percussive element of picking a string, not actually the timbre, the note that's actually, not the timbre, the note that's actually being played. I, I think I've heard that sometimes, and I pushed the headphone to my ear because I could have sworn I had heard it, and when I did that, I didn't hear it anymore, so I'm not actually sure. Um, there is a lot going on and it's very possible I missed it, but I just never picked up on a guitar until the bridge and it had a bit of a bite to it might have been distorted. Um, but the only time I've seen them, they play with an, a classical, an acoustic guitar. So again, I don't, I don't know where this guitar came from. I don't know if this is something they do now. But it comes out of nowhere, doesn't really connect to anything else in the song uh, sonically. Like I said, I can't say I've ever heard this guitar tone prior to this in the verse or the chorus. It comes out of nowhere, and it plays this melody solo that just kind of feels like it's there. It feels like a small adaptation of what the saxophone did without the funky syncopation, if it was played a little straighter. And so it just kind of feels like it's there it just does something it feels space is what it feels like and before it can even finish the saxophone comes in and does a pickup uh, idea that leads us back into the chorus the saxophone comes in on like beat three or four of that flash bar of the bridge um and you know leads us back into the chorus and it feels like we just kind of we put a bridge in there because that's how you make songs you got to have an a b a b c b so we put a C in there, and we didn't really know what to do, so we just kind of threw the guitar in there. Also, it's not that great. We're going to, you know, muddy it around. And look, the saxophone's back. We're getting back into the chorus, back to the dancing part. And that's what it feels like to me. It, it feels lost. It feels inconsequential. It feels um, odd and out of place. And it's built off of entirely new ideas that don't stick around long enough to actually be explored, and thus they feel shallow. And I just don't, I don't understand the point of it. If it's designed for contrast, we should stick around in it longer. Um, if it's designed to, I don't know, explore what if the song didn't have the funky syncopation to it and was played a bit straighter, it should have been around longer. The only reason I could see to make it so short is just to get out of it again. And if that's what you wanted to do, why'd you include it at all? I just, I, I don't know. Maybe some other people have some insight into this. Uh, Family Crest. I know this is the first time I've had these guys on the channel proper. Like I said, they were in a live stream, 
But, uh, you know, we don't do massive in-depth analyses for those. We just, uh, you know, kind of check out music casually. Um, and I talk about things I enjoyed what I heard. We don't really break stuff down. Though. So this is the first time they've been on the channel proper. We might have some Family Crest fans here for the first time on the channel. Um, you know, please let me know what you enjoy about this track. Um, specifically even about that bridge. If there's anything that you can read into it. Uh, maybe it has callbacks to another song, right? I mean, that's one of the things about listening to just one track is that I don't have the context around it. And given that this is the War Act 2 and I know there's a War Act 1, I think these are concept albums. So I could be missing context even from another album. It could be a callback of sorts. Um, you know, so I am missing some of that context. But, you know, looking at the song in a vacuum, just the idea by itself, the 16-bar bridge just... It's it's just not there. It feels like it was done because that's how you build a song. Mainstream, not mainstream, what's a... You know, the most commercial song structure is to put a bridge after your second chorus. Um, and it feels like it was just done because you follow the cookie cutter style and that's the recipe, right? The recipe is to put a bridge in there. So they did and it just feels so... Uh, what's it's lacking conviction I think that's the big thing right there it lacks conviction and I think they even knew that it wasn't that great which is why they bring the saxophone in early to pull us out of it right to kind of prepare us to get into the chorus again because it does just kind of meander I don't want to linger on this any longer um I, I wish I could talk about more of the instruments I really do but there's just not a lot of individuality in the other uh, instruments and once again I could just be comparing this to Beneath the Brine which had fantastic separation of all the instruments because they all had a different role to fill they all were doing different things um, even if it was just range ideas right providing harmonies in a lower range or a higher range which we often saw the flute and the cello kind of doing together uh, there's also multiple vocalists in there that I was kind of hoping to hear here as well and maybe that was a one-off but uh, it just feels like a lot of the things that I enjoyed about Beneath the Brine were not present here and I don't know if Beneath the Brine is the fringe idea or if this is. Uh, like I mentioned they're also very different tonally where Beneath the Brine is more melancholic and this is pretty much a straight up pop song especially as funk um, gets back into the mainstream i feel like i hear more and more funky ideas in 2020s pop music um and it's just it's just becoming kind of normal to hear uh so that makes this feel even more mainstream poppy to me i don't know let's get into some lyrics here and uh you know see if we can't pull some of this together like i said it's possible that the story being told makes things work better but uh, there we go. All right. <clears throat> Cast your heart to the floor, love. Feel the sting, feel of weight of a love not strong enough. So throw your heart to the floor and feel the sting and weight of a love not strong enough. Okay. Your head's on fire, your hands and feet come off the ground, oh sweet desire when your mind is not strong enough. A lot of repetition by the way, this is oh sweet desire when your mind, when your mind, when your mind's not strong enough. Um, I forgot to point this out because I did hear this and what I really loved is you can feel different inflections on all three of these in the song. So while a more traditionally pop artist might have uh, maybe not elected themselves, but their producer would probably elect to record a single fantastic take of the phrase when your mind and then copy paste it. Each one of these is separate. And I think at one point, might have been in the second verse uh, when they did this, uh, there was actually a breath in the middle of it. Really great stuff. I love when a vocalist opts to actually sing everything that gets recorded rather than take a line and uh, you know just repeat it um so yeah something i forgot to mention but i did enjoy that um so yeah your head is on fire your hands and feet come off the ground 
that's interesting. It's not your feet come off the ground, right? This is obviously pushing towards the idea of levitation, but your hands and feet, you are on all fours at this time, which either implies something animalistic or a certain type of defeat where the weight of the negativity has brought you down to your hands and knees. It is, uh, you know, a feeling of, of heavy emotion. It says, oh, sweet desire when your mind is not strong enough. The chorus goes, it's not your head. It's not that your head is gone. It's that your heart's on fire. It's not that the beat of beat is off. It's that your heart is on fire. So we threw our heart to the ground and felt the sting of not loving enough. And our head was on fire and we floated off the ground because our mind was not strong enough. Then we realized it was actually our heart that was on fire and not the fact that our head was gone or that our beat was off. It, a lot of this feels like it's alluding to a very specific sensation that I'm not quite getting. It definitely is, it, it's, a, it's a positive song, I think, is what I'm getting from the chorus. Um, something has happened. Maybe they have forgotten how to love. Maybe they've moved away from empathy. Um, maybe it feels like they've lost their mind kind of vibe. And the chorus says, you know, it's not any of that. It's just that your heart is on fire. And I don't quite know what they're alluding to with that. But it does feel like a song that's saying it's okay to experience what you're going through, but you're looking at the wrong symptom or you're looking at the wrong problem. Clutch your hands to her body and feel the sting, feel the shape of a love not strong enough. Your head's on fire, your hands and feet, all right, same idea. Head's not gone, heart's on fire. Lay back, let the weight go off. Float on, let the feelings grow higher. It's not your head's wrong, it's your heart's on fire. And we can't stop, we've come too far. The silent heart will wait for years and years and years. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Like I said, it's definitely speaking about something very specific. There, there's somebody who feels less than complete for some reason, um, and the narrator is saying, you know, it's, it's fine, it's okay, right? You're just looking at it wrong. It's not that it's this that you think it is, which is pretty big. It's not like your head's gone. It's not like your heart is off beat. Your heart's just on fire, and I don't... And it says you should just lean back and let your feelings grow higher. So almost like, it's almost like stress, right? Stress is bringing this per person down. It feels like they're losing their head. Uh, they're going insane kind of, you know, colloquially speaking, not medically speaking. Life is just getting them down, uh, uh, so to speak. And it says, look, just let it go. Lay back, let the weight go. Let your feelings grow higher and you'll lift off. You'll levitate, right? You'll feel the lightness of it. Almost like saying that this person cares too much and their empathy is causing them stress and they need to let go. Which, for 2022, I can understand. <laughs> maybe that's what's going on though. The heart is on fire. Like, the heart is in pain, right? Or maybe the heart is overworking itself. It's providing too much empathy because we are constantly uh, being thrown stories of tragedy. And it's causing us to feel stressed all the time. It makes it weighty. We fall to our knees, our hands and knees constantly uh, because it's one tragedy after another, sometimes multiple in the same day. Maybe that's what it's about. And you know, the song kind of works with that. Thematically, the song is very dancey, very poppy, very let go and loose. It's all about jamming, right? It is a jam. 
every bit of this. The chorus, I mean, the verse brings it down a little bit, but the chorus brings it right back up between the hi-hat and the syncopated hits and just the, the all-around funkiness, the saxophone bringing light to everything, the falsetto voice bringing the, the overall pitch, I would say, uh, of the song higher. There really isn't a lot of low end here at all. The bass itself has a typical nice warm volume, sorry, a warm sound at a decent volume, um, but it doesn't really work with all of the layers. There's a lot here that kind of overshadows it, and I don't know if there's another bass end instrument, lower range instrument here. So it does feel like the bass, the, the lower end, is underrepresented, and the song does feel very light and floaty. It's, everything's in the higher end, the majority of it is anyways. But it does call in, into question the bridge, unless the bridge is just supposed to exemplify casting away expectations and stress and just doing what works. And, I mean, maybe? Maybe I was overanalyzing the bridge and that was my stress, and if I just let it go and accept it for what it is, I don't have to worry about it as much. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. I do think the ideas of letting go could be better explored musically in a third section. I think the verse and the chorus work well for this theme, but the bridge just, it doesn't showcase it. I really don't think it does. Um, it, it still feels out of place to me, even when we bring in the theme, so... Yeah, I'm going to stick with that. Everything else feels right at home, though, assuming I have the right read on these lyrics. So, those are my thoughts on the Family Crest's Hearts on Fire. This is where you guys come in, hit me up with your comments, let me know if you enjoyed this or not, anything you agree with me on, anything you disagree with me on, anything that you would like to add context to. Like I mentioned, with a lot of these, I really only have this one song to draw information from, and I might be missing information or context from other albums or other tracks. When you're done commenting, you can head into the description box. In there is a link for... In there is a link... Come on, seriously. It's a link for Linktree. It takes you to this menu. It has everything related to the channel in it. You can pick up some merch. Follow me on Twitter. Join the Patreon. Help support the channel. Uh, join the Discord and chat with the rest of the community. As well as a bunch of other stuff. Go ahead and check it out. There's like a dozen links in there. Above that, if you could, you already saw these, like, subscribe, ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, we have a, uh, a Pride song coming up next, checking out an LGBTQ artist. Uh, otherwise, well, I was going to say otherwise, I'll see you guys Sunday. But uh, no, because we do have another Pride track coming out tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, patrons, I will see you Sunday for the live stream. And then Monday, we begin next week's theme. All right, until next week, until next time, whenever next time, you know what? You guys just remember to be critical and not cynical. How's that? Not until next time, just never be cynical. Stick to that critical thinking. We'll all be great. All right, have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.